Track B, burglar alarms and booby traps. Start talking. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm good at, um, so I'll do that. Uh, greetings, thanks for coming. I'm, I'm Marcus Ranum. I'm CEO of Network Flight Recorders. I do intrusion detection stuff, so if you want to apply a vendor bias filter, you may, although I'm really not talking about any vendor stuff here. This is just, uh, this is just some clues about uh, sort of the, the, my current thinking about intrusion detection and some, some tricks for that. And it's not this isn't perfect. This is something I've been wrestling with for quite some time. Um, how do you uh, fairly reliably detect somebody who's broken into your systems after the fact? And there's a couple of different ways of doing it, uh, most of which are lumped under the overall title of intrusion detection. Today I'm going to be talking about a specific subset, or what I see as a subset of intrusion detection, that I like to call burglar alarms. And the idea of a burglar alarm is exactly what it sounds like. It's basically a policy-directed intrusion detection. Uh, for example, I'm not home right now. I'm in uh, Las Vegas. Back at my house, the only creatures that should be moving are three cats. Um, the cats are not authorized to operate doors and windows on the perimeter. They're not authorized to operate the refrigerator doors, nor are they authorized to open certain closets in the house because the doorknobs are, are still out of reach of the cats. Um, I have big cats, in case you're wondering. Uh, but anyway, um, they're not authorized to do these things, so I have a mechanical agent in place that will generate a loud piercing whistle if the perimeter doors are operated. Um, so I guess the cats could operate it, and that would be what we call a false positive. Uh, but if a human being were to operate them, uh, that would also set off an alarm. That would mean that my perimeter security, namely the, the locks on my doors and windows, had not done their job, you know, had not worked correctly. Uh, a second order of burglar alarms within the house would be, for example, if I had a valuable piece of electronics with a uh, hand grenade underneath it with the pin pulled out so that when somebody picks the hand grenade up, they blow themselves into tiny pieces. Um, that would be a form of an alert notification. My neighbors, <laughs> my neighbors would call and say, are you blowing things up again? Please stop. And I'd say, no, I'm in Las Vegas. Call the police. Um, <laughs> I didn't do that. Uh, but anyway, the idea of burglar alarms for networks is, is exactly the same thing. You want to do the electronic equivalent of putting a hand grenade under your stereo. Um, <clears throat> So it's a misuse detection system. In intrusion detection systems, there are two primary paradigms. One is what's called anomaly detection, and the other is called misuse detection. Anomaly detection is where you try to use statistical, heuristic, uh, artificial intelligence, whatever means you want to try to figure out what is unusual. And when things are unusual, you bring them to somebody's attention. Misuse detection is when you have a, a, a dictionary or a, some sort of a computable way of storing all of the things that you know about that could go wrong, and when you see one of those things going wrong, you notify somebody. So I believe that a burglar alarm is a slightly different system from a classic misuse detection system because it's based on your notion of misuse for your particular organization or your particular site. Right? Somebody. Uh, somebody in this room, probably I'd guess at least one person in this room has a burglar alarm at home that's based on a passive infrared or microwave system. In that case, your policy is not only is, no, not only is there no operation of perimeter doors and windows, but no one is moving inside your house. You may have goldfish, goldfish or cockroaches or whatever pets you like, but they're all going to be below the, the, the threshold of activation for a microwave or a passive infrared system. Uh, my cats are too big for that, so I have to I have to use a completely different approach, right? So what I'm building here is a notion for your network where you're going to do the same kind of thing. You're going to identify what should and shouldn't happen in your network, and specifically target misuse de detection systems to alert you in the case that that happens. Right? Here's a simple now back to talking about the slides that I brought, which are supposed to be what I'm talking about. Um, you might care about people port scanning your firewall from inside, but not from the outside. Right? I don't know about you, but uh, my sites get scanned pretty much constantly. Um, that's what we pay for all that bandwidth for, I guess. Um, <laughs> so that the scans complete quickly. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to tell you some tricks about that. Unfortunately, there's, there's ways you can really hurt people who do that, but we won't go into that. Um, anyway, you may not care about people scanning your firewall from the outside, but you may care a whole lot about people
people scanning your firewall from the inside. That's an example of the kind of paradigm we're talking about here. And I'll give you some ideas for some of those. So what you're doing is based on some sort of notion of site um, site-specific security violations you're going to notify the administrator. And the reason that this is important is it may not necessarily correlate to individual security problems. You might come up with a list of things that are ind indicators of potential security problems and then detect real security problems as a second order effect of the first thing happening. For example, somebody is now root. They weren't before. Well, there's a couple of ways that could happen. That could happen because somebody just gave somebody else root as part of administrative duties. The other is that somebody gave themselves root as part of a stack smash or what have you. And in either case, I kind of want to know about that because I'm a bit of a control freak. Um, you might want to know about ro new routers appearing on your networks. From a network level, this isn't too difficult, right? A new router would be... Uh, uh, unless you're, um, unless you're, you've got a router that's doing MAC address spoofing or something weird like that, uh, a new router would be a machine that's got one hardware address that starts emitting IP traffic with various hop counts from or times to live from with different IP addresses. New subnets. Uh, if you see new traffic crossing your network that wasn't tra crossing it before, now that's a good example of a burglar alarm in process. For some people's networks. Having new subnets cross your network is not a big deal. That happens every day. For other people, like me, on my little tiny home network, that is a big deal. If I suddenly started seeing traffic coming to and from, um, I, I don't know where, but um, IBM or something on my home backbone, I'd be really shocked. Um, so again, it's policy directed. And you might want to detect new web servers and so forth. These may or may not represent security problems. They're just cases where there's something's happened on your network that you probably want to know about. Right. The ideal burglar alarm is one where you actually deny the attacker the ability to do the thing that they want to do. This is the place where it gets fun. And I'm still trying to think of a perfect way of doing this, but, but uh, I'll give you some ideas that might let you creep a step forward. Right? If the bad guy is going to want to get on your machine and, um, I don't know, tamper with your website, and that's the way that they score, right? then all you have to do is deny them the ability to do that without you being told, and you've completely defeated the purpose of their getting on your machine to tamper with your website. A uh, simple example, I guess, would be if you had a, a web, system, uh, web server that um, reloaded itself from CD-ROM every 30 seconds. Um, sure, they can alter your web page, but uh, you know, you're going to get some very spotty, uh, uh, well, you're going to get a very badly performing website, too, but you're going to get some very spotty ability for people to change your website. Um, and if you can identify a list of the things that you think that the attacker might want to do when they've broken in, you can very easily set up a pit trap to go off in that circumstance, right? I don't worry too much in my house about putting hand grenades under my boxes of Raisin Bran, um, but putting hand grenades under my stereo would be... By the way, there is no hand grenade under my stereo. This is just an example. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm crazy, not stupid. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I used to build... It, what's really funny is that, that my life has gone in a complete circle. When I was in high school, uh, my very first job was building burglar alarms, and now I'm right back to it uh, umpty, umpty gazillion years later. Uh, but the, the most successful traps that we made back when I was working on burglar alarms in... Uh, this would have been 1978, something like that. Um, the ones that always caught people was the... the uh, the plunger in the jewelry box on the wife's desk, right? The burglar would immediately, if they, if you got a professional cat burglar who'd get around the perimeter security, they'd get around the hardwired alarms in the window. They would immediately run up and open the jewelry box, setting off the alarm. We, you know, jewelry boxes, gun cabinets, um, desk drawers. We used to get them every time with that stuff. So we want to do exactly the same kind of thing today. Right? So, <clears throat> I believe that doing this is a big win for the network manager. As a vendor in this in this space, I can tell you it's a little bit painful because it's difficult for a vendor to think of a way to build a product that's going to be able to work on all of your dis different systems as a burglar alarm. So if you're trying to do burglar alarms, the best place to get them is to build them yourself. In fact, it's almost essential to build them yourself. Imagine if I made a product that was the um, the Network Flight Recorder Burglar Alarm Toolkit version 1.0, which you ran a make file and it installed itself in the standard place on all your machines. Well, now that's like having a map for the burglar are saying, don't pick up the stereo without first disconnecting the wires underneath it. Right? You've given the whole game away. The only way for these things to be effective is for you as the creative, cunning, twisted network manager to think really hard about what kinds of things you want to salt around your network and leave them lying there so if somebody gets in, they're going to set off an alarm.
Um, so you are able to take back the home court advantage, right? The only thing that that, uh, that we good guys, and I'm assuming that I'm talking to a room full of good guys, um, the only thing that we good guys have going for us is the home court advantage. It is our network, and we legally can do sick, twisted things to it. When they do sick, twisted things to our networks, they're violating the law, and we're allowed to pound on them for doing it if we catch them. Um, so we get to do it, they can't. Uh, the only thing we got to worry about, of course, is if we build our network so that it's so booby-trapped that we can't effectively use it. I'd be a little bit careful about that. But the main thing you can do with these is detect the second order effects of a successful break-in. Right? Let's say that you've got a web server that's set up that's going to generate an alarm if any of the pages of interesting content get changed. Uh, let's say that uh, all the index.html files on your system have a uh, file level watchdog that's going to fire if something alters the file. And we'll leave how you could hide that as an exercise. Uh, but it's very, very well hidden. Right? You may not know how the bad guy got in. But if they did get in and they do change your website, you do know that someone got in. And that, I submit to you, is very useful information. Right? You may have audit logs that will let you go back and figure out, uh, figure out more of the details uh, about how they got in after that. Like, um, did they come in through a stack smash in your web server, or yet another send mail bug, or was it some other thing? Um, but you, you were able to detect the fact that it happened in a reasonably short time frame. Right. So what are the advantages of these things? Well, <clears throat> they're really reliable. Best of all, they're reliable and predictable. If you build your burglar alarms to be very simple, they're only going to fire when you, you know, they will the grenade will only go off when you pick up the stereo. As long as you don't pick up the stereo, the grenade will not go off, assuming the cat doesn't knock the stereo over. Um, they're very easy to implement. It doesn't take very long to build these things. Uh, I'll give you a few ideas in a, in a couple of minutes about some fun ones you can build. But if you know Perl or C, and if you're a kernel hacker, it especially gets fun if you're a kernel hacker. But uh, if you're willing to hack your systems up and do some bizarre configuration management, um, it, you can build a good burglar alarm every day. In fact, one fun thing you could do is, you know, if you, if you co-manage some security critical systems with a couple of uh, coworkers, let's say you, you and two of your friends uh, manage these systems, enter into a little pact that once a month, in a rotation, each one of you will implement a new burglar alarm on your important servers. And you will document it and tell the others. Every time somebody sets off one of the burglar alarms, they buy lunch for the other two. Right? And just keep doing this for a couple of months. And after you've done that, you know, for a year, you'll have a system that's just completely wired to the nines so that as soon as anybody touches it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to explode. Um, and then quit and get a job someplace else. And uh, <laughs> you, you, Again, you want to document this stuff. Anyway, they're easy to implement. They're also really easy to understand. One of the big problems with doing security, um, you know, I'm, I'm a pointy-haired suit these days, not a technical guy, so I talk to pointy-haired suits. And, and, and usually the dialogue goes like this, you know, me talking to customer. You need security. Huh? Is the customer response. Right? Why? Prove it. Um, and then the next piece is even after you manage to sell them some security, they ask you the really, really cool question, which is, how do you know it works? Uh, well, that's a real problem, right? This is like being the maker of a bulletproof vest and saying, well, I can show you that it works, right? Bang. Oh, oops. Uh, bang. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, you, it's difficult to prove that something works. A simple burglar alarm is fairly easy to do, right? You just tell the, uh, tell the person, well, look, watch, do this, boom, okay, it just notified you. That's pretty obvious. They're easy to understand, right? You don't have to mess around with fancy statistics. You don't have to mess around with, uh, with um, you know, trying to, to do some kind of AI analysis of what actually occurred, right? If the thing says, you know, I am, uh, I, I am a shell and I am running this route and I didn't think I should be running this route, something has gone wrong, that's a, that's a pretty simple diagnosis. The, the tricky part is figuring out what went wrong, but at least it was able to tell you something's gone wrong. Um, also, burglar alarms aren't going to generate a lot of false positives. One of the problems with a lot of the ID systems out there, the first generation ID systems out there, they're either very, very conservative and they don't pester you much at all, or they're um, aggressive about identifying problems. They wanna, they're, they're like the very, very helpful waiter who comes by every two minutes during your meal and asks you, is everything okay? Um, you you kind of wish it would go away after a while. Um, ID systems cannot pester you too much because if they pester you too much, you're going to start to ignore them. So if you've got a burglar alarm that's set up right, it's going to it's going to notify you when you really need to know what's happening, and, and and not a second before, and hopefully not too long after. 
right? Again, that's kind of like the neighbor saying, you know, your house just exploded. Um, have you been playing with explosives again? No, it wasn't me. Um, I better go call cleanup crew. Um, anyway, <clears throat> okay. Now the disadvantages of burglar alarms, they're policy directed, right? Uh, that's, a, that's a fancy term for, you've got to have an idea what should and shouldn't happen. If your management model for your systems, your network is anybody who wants to does anything that they want, it's very difficult to come up with a reasonable set of things that shouldn't happen. The answer is everything should happen. If you can nail things down a little bit beyond that, then it gets a, it gets a bit, bit easier to come up with a predictable detection system. Um, you also require stability. Right? If you're constantly changing things, you're going to constantly be setting your burglar alarms off, and, and that's not really any fun either. So in some cases, that might be valuable. Let's just imagine that you've got a, a really simple tool. Um, imagine you have a small network, or let's say you've got a, a, a hub where your guest systems all plug in, and, and, and all you've got is something like ARP, um, ARP Watch that's notifying you about uh, new hardware addresses and IP addresses as they show up. You know, that, that's not really a burglar alarm, but, but you might want to know whenever somebody plugs a new machine into the 10Base the T port and lobby or something like that. Um, if you've got a very, very unstable network, if that kind of thing is constantly happening, your ability to make a, a valid determination of risk uh, based on that event is very, 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 very much reduced. And of course, you've got to be careful not to set them off yourself. This can be fun. All right, so here's a, here's a simple burglar alarm, right? Let's say we've got a... Um, a web server and we've done a router with some screening and our policy at the web server is that we're only allowing in standard HTTP and, and SSL which means that the web server is doing its DNS resolution off the firewall uh, and it's bouncing its mail off of someplace else and so forth and so forth. Very, very simple policy. Right. Um, one thing you could do that's fun is uh, slap a copy of IP filter into the bottom of the kernel of the web server and have it scream bloody murder if a packet hits it that doesn't you know, hits it coming from the outside that doesn't match the policy. That would indicate that you've got something seriously wrong with your router uh, or your firewall or whatever. Very simple. Doesn't cost anything. Doesn't cost any performance at all. Hardly um, a little bit of extra management headache. But one of the things that's nice is if you're the web server guy and the router's run by your your router guy, you will not be you'll you'll be notified when your router guy uh, installs a new router and forgets to update the uh, the screening lists in the router or something like that. Again, this is cheap. This is free. There's no reason not to do it. In kernel screening is really easy to generate alerts with. Uh, something like IP filter, you can just have the log option and have things go to a log and have something like swatch or log check notify you as soon as interesting entries begin to appear in the, in the log. So here's some simple, simple examples of an IP felt based burglar alarm. Um, we'll block everything by default. If you wanted your burglar alarm to be a little bit more permissive, uh, you could have it not block everything by default, but just generate alarms and then still permit the traffic through. Right? Um, I, live, I live out in the country, and if somebody breaks into my house, I'm pretty confident that the guy's going to have about 45 minutes to, to take all of my stuff before a cop will even get there. Now, this isn't a suggestion, by the way. Um, there aren't grenades in the house, but uh, anyway. Um, but you know, in the network environment, we can do the equivalent of having the cops show up instantly, right? If you wanted to, you could hypothetically have your burglar alarm wired to something that loads a new set of filters into your router, shutting everything down, or that su shuts your machine down, or that uh, you know, I, I don't know, flips a knife switch on your Ethernet, or blows the explosive bolts on your router, or whatever you want. Um, Right. Uh, here what we're doing, blocking in on our Ethernet chip, logging the body um, from localhost to any. Well, that's kind of interesting. We shouldn't get packets to localhost from off the network, right? So that's going to detect a couple of, uh, a couple of problems right there. Um, now, if we're behind a firewall, this rule is, is, is basically never going to fire. If it does fire, you know you've got a real problem, right? And then here, this is a basic IP spoof detection. If you've got a firewall in front of you, you're, you probably shouldn't be getting spoofed traffic in through your firewall, or you should be talking to your vendor about, it, about an upgrade. Um, and then we're, you know, again, we're assuming that our external router or external firewall is block, blocking source routed packets. Um, other ways of doing it, of course, instead of putting things in the kernel, you could do it as a sniffer. Um, you can do exactly the same stuff with a sniffer. 
Very, very simple, right? Other things you can do that are fun to build burglar alarms is to use overlapping rules in your firewall. We can have different precedents of rules. Most firewalls don't stop you from this. So you can have a higher precedence rule for something that you probably want to know about and then another lower precedence rule for the same thing that you want to block. Um, just to give you an example, <coughs> Let's say our firewall sitting out here has been told to block traffic, um, I don't know, telnet traffic from the inside, from the outside coming into the inside. Well, we can have a slightly higher precedence rule that says um, block tr telnet traffic from the web server coming to the inside and tell us about it, and block telnet traffic from the outside to the inside and don't tell us about it. Right? This one's going to happen all the time. This one should never happen unless something's gone wrong with our, our boundary router up here and someone's gotten into our web server and is playing around. Now, it's not perfect, right? If somebody's gotten in here and all they want to do is trash our web server and not try to tell it into the rest of our network, this burglar alarm won't fire. So if you're worried about this kind of thing, you might want to have a, a couple of other little bombs hidden on the web server itself. Uh, another one you might want to think about. Lena, Again, we're assuming we're assuming that our attacker is is quasi lame. <clears throat> yeah. the the usual pro the usual problem with the burglar alarm concept is there's usually some smart kid in the room who says, "Yeah, but I wouldn't be lame enough to do this." Well, you know, all the smart kids aren't going to be lame enough to do this, but the one that gets into your machine might, or you might be clever enough to have come up with something other than these lame examples that I've got here. Um, so. You know, let's say we're worried about somebody getting onto our web server and going out to IRC and bragging about it. We might just have something in here that allows it out or blocks it and notifies us when it sees it. So you can use the same kind of input filtering on the router to detect all kinds of cool stuff coming from your network that shouldn't happen as a separate set of rules. Again, all of these kinds of all these kinds of approaches rely on the assumption that the policy between your web server or your critical boundary systems is something that is simple to define. If your web server is allowing 85 different protocols back and forth, you're not going to be able to do this effectively. Of course, if your web server is running 85 different protocols back and forth, your web server is not secure anyway, so you know, you're, you're basically screwed. Um, <clears throat> What? What if your web server's IIS? Well, <clears throat> anyway, um, I you know I don't know I don't know enough about I don't know enough about the NT, uh, but um, the any any reasonable operating system has sufficient properties that you can probably build some decent bird alarms on it. NT does have file watchdogs, for example. Uh, nobody uses them. So maybe they don't really work right. But if they did work right, you could probably build some pretty nifty bird alarms out of those on an NT box. In fact, you know, I'm I'm really I'm really amazed that someone hasn't come out with a win. This isn't a suggestion, by the way. Someone hasn't come out with a Win32 app that just sets a bunch of file watchdogs on critical things and sell it as you know IIS secure version 2.0. Raise a bunch of venture capital, do an IPO, and buy a Ferrari. Um, <laughs> Secure is Microsoft IIS. Yeah, okay, great. You know, and but think about it, all the people are going to see that as a safety blanket, and you're going to be selling safety blankets so fast your arm will wear out. Um, I like to do security right though. So uh, anyway, uh, so you can build them with sniffers. You can build them within kernel packet filters. You can build them within kernel with application packet sniffers, and of course you've got application logs too. Um, applications are typically not very good about logging. Uh, things that shouldn't happen, unfortunately. Applications generally tend to notify you that they've had a problem by leaving a core file. Um, but if you've got the time and you've got the energy, you can take the source code, if you're dealing with an open source environment, you can take the source code for your applications and add a little bit of extra telemetry into it. So, you know, sure, instead of applying the fact patch that fixes the buffer overflow, you might want to apply a patch that notifies you about the attempt to use the buffer overflow. Right? The code mostly worked without complaining. That's how it got in there and got released in the first place. So you could add a couple of extra lines saying, you know, um, HTTPD, um, someone just tried to buffer overflow me using yawn the, the, this particular hole once again. Um, that could be an interesting statistic for senior management. We pointy haired suits like that stuff. Um, <clears throat> okay, here's, here's another one. Let's say we've got some um, 
this is this is this is lame, okay? But it, it, it can help you. Let's say we've got some established keyword screening in our router. It's blocking uh, inside to outside connections, and we want to know about the occurrence of this happening. This is basically a, a port, a simplistic port scan detector. You're not going to catch the super fancy port scans, but um, all you do is set up TCP wrapper on various port ranges, so when someone connects, you do something about it. Very very simple. Right? If we're assuming our policy is HTTP and SSL are the only things that are getting in here, and maybe let's say DNS, we probably shouldn't be getting anything up at high port ranges. So we can have something listening in here um, that's going to notify us when we get connections up on the high port ranges. Um, this is just a simple example of how you do it. Um, this is this is for, uh, an old old example of a TCP wrapper file. You define a couple of bug ports. It runs a particular command. You don't have to use this command. You could use other commands. If you want to be more conservative about not raising false positives, instead of doing safe finger and generating a separate alert for each time one of your bug ports fires, you could have them all create a touch file someplace in a directory and have a cron job sweep the directory. And if there are more than a certain number of touch files in a certain period of time, um, roll them all together and generate an alarm. There's all kinds of things you can do and it's just a simple you know 10 line shell script and that's the the uh, Etsy services entries for, for doing that um, other fun things this is this is a cute one works works good uh, this is for BSD um, Linux presumably has the same thing someplace in it um, most Unix likes op like operating systems have to have this anyway if it's got truth and you've got source code it's going to have this someplace in it um, but in a BSD type system uh, what you can do is, let's assume you've got a web server that's truted. Your web servers are running truted, right? Um, you know, let's assume your web server is running truted. It should not try to ever do another truth, unless you've really badly misconfigured it and you want to know about that too. The places where it might try to do another truth would be if somebody's, I, I don't know, trying to truth its way out after they've done a stack smash. Um, here, what you're doing is, um, this is the uh, the the root file, this is a pointer to the, the in-core uh, Vino to the root file system um, of the current process. So if it's not null, we've already done a truth. So you might just generate a warning if that happens. This would be a good thing to put on a firewall product if you were building one. Uh, this one's really lame, but it works. Um, <clears throat> Pick a couple of important commands and just learn never to run them as root and replace them with hacked up versions or a shell script or a wrapper that buzzes an alarm as soon as they ever get run as root. So let's say you can teach yourself to, to just type echo instead of ls and as soon as someone gets in the machine, I mean, ls is pretty much one of the first things you do when you're groveling your way around somebody else's system. There's all kinds of other fun places you could put this and of course if you've got source code, you could put this directly in the shell for example, that would be kind of fun. Other ones that are fun. This is getting a little bit harder to do with with um, with some of the operating systems. Uh, I, I'm actually kind of bummed. I haven't visited Solaris for for quite a while, and Solaris has changed, so it's hard to do this now. But uh, you can do it. You can do it pretty easily with the open source, uh, the op various open source Unixes. Uh, when a system call is executed, the parameters get pushed on the stack, and then a trap is issued. Prior to issuing the trap, you're running in user space. You can syslog whatever the heck you like from out of there. It's going to slow things down a little bit. But if you're dealing with an oper with a system call that doesn't get called a whole lot, it's not very difficult, um, and it's not going to do an awful lot to your performance. If you, for example, syslogged all of the execs on your machine, syslogged all of the connects on your machine, you might even syslog all of the accepts on your machine. Um, you know, it's very easy to do, and you just hack up a couple lines, rebuild your kernel, and I really don't think that. Most of the um, most of the script kitties out there are going to be looking at your kernel to see if you've put that kind of stuff in there. You can either put it in the kernel or you can put it in user space in a shared library. Um, other ones, this one's kind of lame. I did this one ages ago and it worked, but um, if, if you're worried about people setting up sniffers instead of having to, uh, you know, instead of having them have to d configure their own devnet, you can leave them your own devnet or BPF driver that just screams if somebody opens it. Um, it'd probably be a, it'd pr it would be a fun exercise, but it'd be too much code to write a, a, a BPF driver that just cheerfully gives people random packets that contain passwords. That would be, a, I mean, <laughs> writing, a, writing a random packet emulator would probably be a lot of work, but you could do it, I guess. Um, a better one would be to just halt the machine. Uh, generating kernel panics is also a good thing to do. If you generate a kernel panic, then you've got a, uh, 
uh, a very nice crash dump if you've got save core enable. You've got a very nice crash dump of the state of the system at the time when the incident occurred. You've got all of the running processes, including the one that caused the, the system to occur. They're all sitting there in kernel memory. You know who they are. And all the, uh, the, uh, the, the TCP PCBs are sitting there for you to grovel through. Um, <clears throat> this one's not particularly sophisticated, but it also works pretty nicely. Um, just diffing stuff works nicely. I mean, um, uh, friends of mine were doing this on systems back when I was an undergraduate, and, and it worked great for catching people back in 1981. Um, just diff stuff against what you think you should be running. You can do this fairly easily. You don't probably want to be running NFS on your important systems, but, but that's one thing it's good for. You can just have a machine that NFS mounts file systems, runs diffs against things, and then unmounts them. That can be a separate separate box that just sits there and does nothing except for that once a day. Or maybe that uh, NFS mounts or copies files off of a server and uh, runs tripwire against them. Or that you know mounts and tripwires everything or tripwires everything and then compares them against a, a, a remotely mounted file file system full of tripwire databases. There's all kinds of different ways of doing this, but this is really valuable. Assuming that your systems have a fairly steady state. If your system's constantly changing state, forget it. Um, this one works really nice. Um, you can put it in all kinds of great places. You can put it in cron. You can put it in, you could have a separate program called swapped maybe that did this. Um, Log files should never shrink without the inode number changing, and they probably, if you use normal, if you use the normal um, new syslog function to, to rotate your syslogs, uh, they probably shouldn't change except for around the time frame when new syslog is supposed to run. Um, we recently had a little incident on our site when our SSHD log suddenly disappeared during the middle of the day, um, and it very nicely notified us about that happening. A little bit too late, but it was nice to know that it happened. Um, as soon as something like that happens, you now know that it's time to it's time to sync your disks and uh, power things off and start looking through your free blocks for 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 log entries. Um, but it's fairly easy to to engineer this kind of stuff into things. Uh, another really fun project I haven't I haven't gotten around to coding it. I'm I'm hoping to have it done someday. It's it's just really trivial if you think about it. Um, take advantage of Unix file system semantics. Hold an open file descriptor to your log. Use stat and fstat to see if the inode number and the file size have changed unpredictably. If they have, because you had the open file descriptor, you can just seek back to the beginning and write the thing back out to someplace else if somebody deleted it. Now, if somebody overwrote the file, it's going to be a little bit tricky, but uh, again, you'll be able to detect that instance because the, the actual file size will have changed rather than simply being deleted. But a lot of the time, you'll find somebody just gets in there and they do an RM on uh, they do an R RM on your SSHD log. It's kind of nice to have another product process cheerfully write your SSHD log someplace innocuous and notify you about that having happened. Uh, this is a really great one. Um, a friend of mine did this one a long, long time ago. They had somebody who, um, uh, an intern named Susie, who thought that she was thought that she was going to be an elite hacker, and um, kept prying around on the system. So one that one night, Boyd just went around and installed a program called Terrify that took one parameter. Here it's called uh, here it's called Watchdog, and you just see the things logged in. Somebody might care. In fact, one of the fun things that your Watchdog program could do is nothing except tell you when somebody's starting to try to kill it. Or you could have a version of init that tells you when someone tries to kill it. Right? So all the thing actually does is exist. It doesn't really do anything. Very low CPU load, very low performance impact, um, very effective if you're dealing with somebody stupid. Um, <coughs> other things to think about is to make things that look like uh, look like Trojan horses or look like look like hack tools. Um, <coughs> This is not this is not a perfect idea. It seems to work okay. Uh, I did some I did some research a while ago with a, a toy that that emulates a back orifice server. It's nothing fancy. It's it's certainly not rocket science. But um, I'm starting to think that this is just a wonderful area to, to to mine. You know, you can develop as many things as you like that pretend to be something with a vulnerability in it that scream bloody murder when someone tries to execute them. In fact, you could you know conceivably even build a a complete insecure Unix uh, uh, operating system simulator that people could hack away into their heart's content and you could uh, you could get an idea what they were doing. You could even market it and, you know, I don't know, call it NT. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> um, other things to consider doing, this is, this is a little bit less of a burglar alarm, a little bit more of a proactive uh, technique. Um, your users will scream bloody murder if you do this. A couple of us did this, did this back in 89 on some machines. Um, if it's a dedicated service machine, this is easy to do, but just remove the ability to set the execute bit in multi-user mode. It's a couple of, it's a couple of uh, lines of change to, uh, to the kernel's uh, change mode uh, routines. Um, and you could also have it so that uh, you've got to be attached to a physical terminal. That's also, you know, a couple other lines to add to the kernel. That's really effective. It means your users can't download programs and run them anymore. Um, that's going to help a great deal. Um, and of course, if it's a dedicated machine, if all this thing is is a web server, um, this is going to solve the case where your ponytail Mac guys go and install some new plugin into your web server that makes it insecure. Um, it's also going to make it a lot harder if somebody breaks in there uh, to, down, to download and run things. You might at least surprise them. Um, <clears throat> A couple different versions of Unix now block against attempts to execute code from the stack. This is a good thing to run if you're worried about stack smashing. It is not a panacea. There, there doesn't seem to be a panacea to stack smashing except to write perfect code, uh, which is really, really hard, believe me. Um, I've humiliated myself there a couple times. Um, and some of the people in this room did it to me. Um, but the, the, the main thing that happens there is that uh, you, you can prevent a, a, a certain number of buffer overruns. It means that the person who's doing it is going to have to call to a function instead of uh, loading their own function into your stack space. Other fake holes. This one's not. This one's not rocket science either, but it works good. Um, install something that looks like a well-known hole, and then just have it record whenever somebody runs it. So you can have a PHF bug, or you, know, you could even have. Um, I don't know. You could configure your configure your version of Apache to um, answer as if it was IIS, and then record all the all the different uh, IIS attacks against it when they happen, or, or whatever you wanted to do there. Um, this one works pretty good. Did this one first in. Um, I guess it would have been 1988. Uh, it, it's, it's, actually, it's actually really sneaky. This is a variant of the trick that, that map makers use to determine if somebody is copying and reselling their maps. Um, what you do is have a user with an obvious but crackable password and do something. There's all kinds of places you could put it. You could put it in the login process. You could put it in their dot login if you want to be lazy. There's all kinds of places you could put it. But have it notify somebody immediately if that user ever logs in. Now, <clears throat> you pretty much know for a fact if somebody ever logs in as that user that um, your password file's been grabbed. Right? And that's interesting. You don't know how the password file was grabbed, but you know from the, the, the second order effect that it was grabbed. If you're using, if you're using something like a hashed password, you know, a, um, excuse me, a shadow password file, then this is really interesting because it means that somebody's gotten a hold of your shadow password file, um, which I guess means you're already rooted. So, um, guess, <laughs> okay, that's not a great example. In that case, you're... <laughs> In that case, your your whole you, your whole day is ruined already, and it's probably been ruined for some time. But I guess you know, I guess at least you know about it. If you were using if you were, yeah if you're using shadowed passwords in the dum dum user file, this would be one of those. Darn, <laughs> I guess I'll take the weekend off. <laughs> um, kind of ideas. All right. Anyway, so so I just wanted to try to trigger some thoughts in your head about uh, about a couple of ideas to to. Um, protect your systems. Think about doing this. The, the, the security technologies that are out there are, are large numbers of them are flawed and, and certainly nothing is perfect. And if you're worried about things going wrong, um, you should start to think about ways to detect things after they've gone wrong. And, and right now, this is one of the best ways that I know of. Um, these are lame examples. The fact that I've been going around talking about them, uh, you know, means that they're useless, right? I, I suppose if somebody was going to come after, you know, one of my machines, they might they might think that that all these pit traps might be in place. In fact, they're not. I'm not that cool. Um, I don't have time to put all these in place. I've got other ones or some of the other ones in place, but you got to come up with your own, right? If you don't have the imagination to do these, um, you're probably not going to be able to. But if you've got a twisted imagination and you like coming up with, with, with cunning ideas, this is a great way to spend some time. And believe me, you'll be a hero if, if one of these things fires. You know, if, you're building a, if you're building a security critical web server that's going to sit out there and be a target for your whole organization, um, 
you want to be the person who's able to say, you know, we were hacked and we were only hacked two minutes ago. Um, I, see, I'm on the job. I, I know, you know, I was able to find out. And of course, then what they're going to say is how, and you'll say, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm still working on it. Um, I guess you get to keep your job for a while. Anyway, um, so that's what I had to talk about. I don't know if you've got any questions, comments, rocks, um, tomatoes, nothing. Yeah. I've been running backups with friendly for a little while, and uh, now I log some obvious attempts here and there. Guys, these are ignoring me. Uh, his comment is, he runs back officer friendly and he logs various attempts and complaints to ISPs and they ignore him. Yeah, well, well you know, what do you expect them to do? Um, the big ISPs have got, you know, some of them have got thousands of, of security complaints pending. And, you know, I sometimes think that pending means that they're stacked neatly in the garbage. But um, uh, the, the back officer friendly thing, if, if anybody cares, you can get it off of www.nfr.net slash BOF. There's Unix source code for it and there's a Windows 32 version. It's just a toy. It's um, it's nothing. It's nothing super duper, but it does it does work. I I wrote it because somebody uh, nailed a friend of mine's machine with back orifice and grabbed a bunch of stuff. And then um, I know some I know some wealthy people who have all their information connected to the internet and they don't really realize that their machines are constantly being scanned. It's really entertaining to put it on machines that are connected to cable modems. Uh, those things get scanned 20, 30 times a day, and then the cable. Well, one of the problems. That, that I keep finding with intrusion detection is the more you detect, the more scared you get, and the more you ruin your quality of life. And sometimes, <laughs> sometimes ignorance is truly bliss. I was certainly happier a couple of years ago when I had no idea how bad the problem is. And the more I re realize how bad it is, the, the more unhappy I get. Um, you know, people scan my machine constantly. Um, I, I guess it's funny. I don't know, but um, you'll get scanned constantly. No, the the comment the comment it's a legitimate one was it depends what you mean by getting ignored by ISPs. Um, so I, some ISPs have such a backlog that you know you're you're basically dealing with a queuing problem. They may get back to you in in, in some period of time. Yeah, that's that's really an acknowledgement protocol problem. You know, um, some ISPs have it. So if you send mail to abuse at the ISP, it sends you back a form letter saying thank you for your message. We'll get back to you as soon as we as soon as we have some time. Uh, you know, I I have absolutely not. I, Please do not construe any of this as criticizing ISPs. I have absolutely nothing but pity for the security managers for ISPs. I mean, we should we should all have a moment of silent grief for them because their lives are truly full of pain. I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Right. The comment is uh, is many people complain to ISPs, but they don't submit any information. Yeah, that's one of the problems. Again, this is one of the reasons why we should all be sympathetic to the the poor ISP network managers. Um, you know, what do you do? You get a user that says, "Help! I'm being hacked." Okay, thanks. <laughs> I'm really having trouble hearing you. Yes, there's a program called Fake BO that does the same kind of thing. Oh, okay. It includes a bunch of stuff. Well, in in putting in burglar alarms, are you going to actually do anything about it? Do, oh, do you actually add vulnerabilities? Well, that, that's an interesting question. I mean, a, a, a really early version of back officer friendly had a buffer overrun in it. Ah, uh, the pain. Well, seriously, I mean, you know, look, look, look. Let's let's not clown around here. I mean, I'm a reasonably paranoid code writer, and and if it, if if I make buffer overruns in a mere five-page hack, think what. You know the interns that are writing all those whiz bang products that your users are running on their desktops are doing. Um, so, so yeah, potentially any program that you're running on your system is an increased vulnerability. I, I don't, I don't have a good answer to that. Uh, if if things like uh, you know fake bo or back officer or whatever are running in an environment 
that has a reasonable security model, then you could probably say, yeah, it's true and it's not too big of a problem. Um, uh, I, I don't have a perfect answer for this. One of the other things I keep daydreaming about is, is, is what's the, we, we've been kind of scratching our heads about this. Is there any value to having all of these kinds of f trap tools begin to send their information to some central location where we could keep a statistic about who is doing the most scanning and, you know, just turn all that stuff over to the FBI, which would be interesting, not because I think it would actually do anything, but it would, it would put the FBI in the same position that the poor security guys at the ISPs are, that they'd have 300,000 outstanding complaints, and then they would be a little bit more sympathetic about leaning on the ISPs, saying, worry about your security. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of interesting problems in this area. This is, this is a really interesting area for research or applied troublemaking or whatever you want to call it. Other questions, comments, stuff. Is anybody anybody today aside from me running burglar arms on your system? Cool. Good. Good. Do it. It works. It really does. Anybody any of you guys had your butt saved by one? See? Yeah, it really it really does work. Yes. Ah, yeah, the comment is if somebody somebody could use these things as denial of service tax. It depends on your firing mechanism. That's one of the that's one of the open questions. I should I should add a slide about this. That's one of the open problems with burglar alarms is the what do you do, right? Burglar alarms can represent a denial of service in a lot of different ways. If you've got a, a, a simple burglar alarm, like let, let's say you're running um, back officer friendly on your dial-up link and you're getting scanned ten times a day. If you try to actually backtrack and do something about all of those scans, you're not going to get any work done. You're going to lose your job and you're going to be on welfare in three months. Um, assuming you have a job. Um, so in some cases, just the work that can be produced by detecting problems can be a problem in and of itself. You've also got the problem in some cases, if your burglar alarm does something radical like halts the system, you've now given the attacker or the potential attacker a remote halt command. That's probably not a good thing either. So when you design these things, you've got to design them from the standpoint of what you want to accomplish when something goes wrong. If you're building a product, let, let's, let's imagine we were building a firewall product here. It's a, it's it's a proxy firewall and we're afraid of buffer overruns. We're, you know, we're afraid of all kinds of stuff. You might very well want to have the thing halt itself if, um, if somebody tries to execute stuff off the stack. And at that point, you'd be dinking around, dinking around in kernel code. And you can do that because you're building a product, right? And in that circumstance, you might have the thing halt itself, reboot, come back up, and give the customer a, you know, error 106 has occurred. Please return this unit to the vendor for field service or something like that and then you can get the thing back and dig through the core file and figure out what went wrong. And that, that's one of the other problems is how do you get useful diagnosis out of these things. I, I really like the idea of the burglar alarms because you can get useful diagnosis in a lot of cases. Um, when I keep looking at intrusion detection systems, the, the host-based systems have a, a, a fairly easy job. Look at uh, a, a simple host-based IDS, right? Grep for bad SU in var ADM messages. That's a really simple host-based IDS. Um, you, you could get some venture funding and marketing literature and go do an IPO off of that. Um, I'm not joking. Anyway. Um, um, uh, but, you know, the reason that that works nicely is because the application knows the error intimately. Applications are the place to catch the error intimately. And it can tell, I mean, think about that. Um, host name, you know, timestamp, host name, login, bad, you know, sorry, bad SU, right? Username, at TTY P0. That's a complete diagnosis in one line. You can't get that any place except for the application. Um, so one of the things I'd love to do is figure out some way of convincing the vendors that they should start putting much, much better application telemetry into their code. You know, why fix the buffer overrun instead of telling you about somebody trying to trigger it? Well, the problem is that scares the customer and also means that the vendor has to admit that they had a buffer overrun there in the first place rather than just saying, oh, that's not really a problem. It's just a conceptual problem nobody could really uh, really attack you with. Other, yeah. Um, Burglar alarm, and then having your, your network scanning tools ignore it because you 
Ah, oh, okay. Um, interesting question. Uh, the, doesn't doesn't putting a burglar alarm in place give you the, the possibility that the actual hack could be installed over the alarm and then your scanning tools would continue to generate a false positive, well actually a real positive and you keep thinking it's a false positive and ignoring it. Yeah, that would that would be a problem. Um, you know, if you were running something like a, 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 a fake BO server, um, somebody could hit you with a real BO server and you wouldn't you, you wouldn't be able to know about it. Um, if your security model is that that's the kind of scanning that you do, that probably wouldn't be the best approach for you. In that case, I, I would suggest that you build yourself more of the kind of grenade under the stereo burglar alarms rather than the, than the fake, door fake door burglar alarms. Yeah. Other questions? Cool. Well, I hope this has been useful. Oh, wait, one more. Yeah. Something real quick. When you start looking, the numbers are probably going to be so astounding that management is never going to believe them. His comment is when you start looking, the numbers are going to probably be so astounding that management won't believe them. That's exactly right. That's one of the reasons why why I, I wrote back Officer Friendly was to give them to pointy-haired suits and say, run this on your home machine. And then they'd call me up the next day and go, oh my God, what do I do? And I'd say, well, actually, there's nothing you can do about that. Just, you know, hang on and pray. You know, you're running Windows, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> So you know that's that's one of the that's one of the problems, but but that does happen a lot. I mean, we were we were in a situation earlier or late last year where we installed a, a sniffer-based intrusion detection system on a on a customer's network, and they swore up and down that our, our system must be wrong. We couldn't possibly be seeing that kind of stuff on their ultra-secure network. And we said, well, yeah, yeah, we did. Look, we'll we'll reformat the hard disk for you and reinstall from scratch. See, look, it's still seeing it. No, no, no. You must be getting garbled packets. I mean, how clueless is there? Yeah. The more you look at this stuff, the worse it gets. You know, the situation is getting worse constantly. So, I don't know quite what to do. I, I actually, the, the last time I was giving a talk at a conference, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll close on this because it's kind of disgusting, but um, I commented, I commented that you know I'm getting a little bit desperate because I think things are getting worse, and I, I, I see no sign of light at the end of the tunnel. And, and somebody in the room asked, "Well, so so what are you going to do? Quit your job and become a plumber?" And then afterwards, at the break, we realized, you know, my my life really wouldn't change if I was a plumber. I'm still worried about the traffic. I'm still worried about the contents of my pipes. I'm still worried about where it goes. When a hole gets in my pipe, I still have to clean it up and it still stinks. <laughs> I get paid better than a plumber. All right. Good luck and keep your mops handy, I guess. Have a good day. Enjoy the conference.